Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Two Pence Worth. This is a series where we hear about the stories, the successes and the challenges of female founders in climate tech. I was inspired to do this series when I learned the fact that in 2022, for every one pound of VC money, less than two pence went to companies with female founding teams. And when you consider the fact that 20% of UK businesses are all female led, it just shows you what a clear discrepancy there is between the percentage of women out there running businesses and the people that are getting given the money. So through my work, I wanted to try and do my part to shine a spotlight on the achievements of some amazing female founders in climate, provide a space where we can celebrate their wins, acknowledge those challenges that they faced, but most importantly, and what I hope you'll get from today, are some resources, some advice and some tips that have helped those founders along the way. And today I am absolutely thrilled to be joined by Sasha Celestial One, co-founder and COO of Olio. Olio is a free food sharing app which connects communities and allows people to share food for free that would otherwise end up as waste. And it's not just food, you can list back to school items, household goods. I've even listed a Christmas tree in the past. Olio was founded in 2015 by Sasha and her co-founder, Tessa, and they've gone on to enjoy great success, raising over £50 million in funding and most recently closing a Series B raise for £43 million. They've grown their business to over 150 employees and they've also shown us a masterclass in brand building, featuring on numerous podcasts, TED Talks and countless lists, including Sasha being listed as one of the 50 coolest founders quite the accolade and I don't think I'd be overstating it to say they've become almost the poster girls for female entrepreneurship in climate. Sasha has built an impressive career working in consulting and financial services for some of the world's leading corporates including McKinsey and American Express before beginning her entrepreneurial journey. So Sasha thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. My I think pleasure. I'm more of the, the poster middle-aged woman as opposed oh. to the girl at this stage, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I always begin by asking our founders to tell us a little bit more about their business. So for anyone out there that isn't familiar with Olio already, could you just give us a brief overview on the platform? What do you do? Who is it for? What makes it special? Sure thing. Um, so Olio is a, an app that connects neighbors with each other. Uh, to give away, or most recently we added the ability to sell surplus food and household items directly with other um, like-minded people in your community. Um, And we have neighbors meeting on the doorstep 1.2 million times a month um, to give away and share their surplus um, so that it can be valued and used instead of going to waste. Uh, We also have a um, solution for businesses, food businesses who have food that's perfectly edible that they would be throwing away if it weren't for um, our sort of army of volunteers that we've recruited from our community. And we have put them through a food safety training and we match them with businesses in real time to collect the surplus food, bring it home and then redistribute it from their home to the local community. And we redistribute um, about two and a half million meals a month for free um, through the app, through our Food Waste Hero program. And that is Olio in a nutshell. Fantastic. And how, how, what was the origin story? Talk me through where did the idea come from? How did you meet Tessa? What, what was the kind of the genesis, I suppose, of, of Olio? So Tessa and I actually met 20 years ago now, nearly um, at business school. And, um, you know, we've been sort of really close friends ever since. Um, And we were both at a crossroads, I guess, eight years ago, sort of taking a look at our corporate careers. Um, We are both new mothers and asking ourselves, is this really, um, you know, how do we want to spend the rest of our professional lives? Could we be doing something to give back to make the world, frankly, a better place for our children? And we started actively looking for an environmental challenge that we could tackle at scale, leveraging our collective skills and experience, something that was scalable, mobile, et cetera. Um, And and we did actually come up empty handed um, during our sort of search, which we pursued both of us with consulting backgrounds quite diligently. We had frameworks and, you know, methodologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But in the middle of that, Tessa had an experience, a personal experience, which was the origin story, the light bulb moment, whatever you want to call it. She was moving house and she found herself on moving day with some food that was not perishable that she had assumed she'd be able to put into her packing boxes and ship home. And the removal people said, absolutely not, throw it away, which she wasn't going to do. 
So she went out on the street with two small children in the middle of winter and tried to find someone to give the food to, which didn't work, was very embarrassing and, and, and frustrating. And she ended up smuggling the food anyway. And when she told me that story, we, you know, it was obvious that that was completely unnecessary. If she had an app that made it easy for her to connect with people who wanted food, um, you know, that would have been a really simple problem to solve. Um, and um, there's a sharing app for everything. Why not for food? But it wasn't really until we sort of Googled food waste and we found out just what a problem it is. It's just, it's enormous, right? Uh, $1.2 trillion worth of food goes to waste every year. If food waste itself were a country, it'd be the third largest emitter of carbon emissions after um, the USA and China. And so it's just a really big problem. And meanwhile, we've got not just a cost of living crisis, but around the world, nearly a billion people going to bed hungry every day. And we could feed them all if we just didn't waste all of this food. So the the, the urgency to do something um, that we might be able to address within our lifetime, combined with the sort of like, why doesn't this exist already, um, just made us decide literally that day within an hour to go ahead and launch Olio back in February 2015. Wow. And and. The world has changed a lot, right, in that period of time, from 2015 to now, both in terms of the things we've gone through, uh, yeah. you know, the glaring pandemic right in the middle of that, right, and, and where we are today, which is an increasing consciousness and awareness amongst the community at large, I suppose, of the issue of climate change and of waste and how, how the two interplay. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's great. It's like, uh, I suppose your idea has kind of weathered some very different times in that I suppose in 2015 you're kind of catering to people who maybe have done a big shop for the week and aren't going to use it all because they're here there and everywhere people are living busy lives and it works for that it probably worked really beautifully through the pandemic where yeah. people are wanting some interaction with their community and, and wanting to help each other out if you can't get to the shop but you need food and then afterwards you know now people are more aware of waste but how, how has that journey been for you and how much has your idea had to evolve or struggled through challenges as the world has changed with it? Oh, goodness. That's a good question. Um, in the beginning, we attracted the attention of all the early adopters. But the irony is that people who already hate food waste and are aware that it's a problem don't have food waste. Right. They're not they're not looking at a half a pizza and going, well, I don't want to eat that tonight. I'll just put it in my food bin, right? <laughs> they're freezing it or they're, I don't know, having it for lunch the next day. And so they, you know, when we bring them into the app, because they're very excited and word spread quite quickly, then they might have a clear out where they're like, okay, I'm never going to drink that tea. I'm never going to make that sushi roll, whatever. But then after that, that, we weren't really solving a pain point for them. Mm -hmm. So that is actually one of the reasons that we quite quickly brought in the non-food section, because we did realize that there's household consumables all around half a bottle of shampoo or I don't know, you know, there's just stuff all around our house that's perfectly usable, doesn't belong in the bin, but not worth, you can't take it to the charity shop, you can't sell it, et cetera. Um, cosmetics, nail, you know, et cetera. Um, but then, so that was sort of the, the early stage and that's why we ended up um, working with businesses is because we actually realized that even though the vast majority um, excluding the farm, 70% of food waste in the UK takes place in the home and three fourths of that is edible at the time it's thrown away. So there's, we are the sort, like us individually, households are the biggest part of this problem. We also realize this can be the hardest part to solve for because it's con mainstream consumer behavior change, right? To have impact at scale. So what we needed in our marketplace for surplus food was more, more for surplus food. So that's when we started working with the businesses because they do have, even though retail food waste only accounts for less than 5% of all food waste. It's still, you know, megatons of food. And we realized that we could take that food and there was a consistent source of supply into the marketplace. Um, and the demand has always been there. It's the inner hunter gatherer and all of us, um, you know, people hate to see good food go to waste. It's, um, it's very much a modern problem that, you know, for most of our history as a species hasn't been something that, you know, that, that we have, have lived with or gotten accustomed to. So, um, so bringing in the businesses was then the next major part of our journey. Um, but you're right that during the pandemic, um, we actually saw more sharing in the first five months of the pandemic um, in terms of pickups and people actually meeting um, on the doorstep at a safe distance than we saw in the first five years of Olio. I mean, wow. it was just like that. And all of a sudden, everyone is very much aware of um, uh, feeling isolated, aware of, 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 of their neighbors potentially being in need, um, and, and also just at home, looking around their house going, oh my God, I got a lot of stuff. What should I do with it? 
So that was that was a real step change for us in terms of um, um, being able and on the back of that growth as well, it, it really helped us to to raise incremental capital. So we were able to invest in marketing and we just had the whole flywheel spinning. Um, and so that was quite good. Um, we're now in this period where demand is higher than ever. Um, we have so many new people who have joined up to the platform because they're struggling to feed their families or they're struggling to, you know, they're, they're, they're the hidden hungry amongst us who, um, you know, have homes and jobs and, and cars and mobile phones, but it's the, the family food budget is a source of significant stress. But annoyingly, because of the macroeconomic con- in, in, environment, um, businesses, uh, we've seen sustainability fall down the, the corporate agenda which has made our selling in, our sales cycle into into businesses to get them to do the right thing and donate um, their surplus food. It's been it's been more challenging than it has before. So whilst demand's at an all time high, um, we're actually um, you know, our, our ability to to convert businesses, quote unquote, to persuade them to sign up and to donate their surplus food has proved more challenging, which has been quite frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I noticed Tessa had posted something fairly recently about the fact that it wasn't going to be mandated for them to. It is just uh, it's so frustrating. Um, this is a bill that was introduced back five years ago, um, and it's been touch and go ever since. Yes, we've had Brexit and pandemic and everything. I understand that why it's been delayed, but it finally went into consultation. This is to manda- mandatory uh, food waste reporting for businesses to basically publish the data about how much food they're wasting, you know, what gets measured gets done or whatever the expression is. Even the supermarkets and the industry all supported this regulation. Mm. So there was no industry pushback and DEFRA still hasn't approved it. And it's, it is a massive blow. And where there's actually a petition going around right now that we, um, and we're working with Feedback, which is a campaigning organization to actually look at Potentially the legality of DEFRA deciding to to to, to not uh, put this regulation into law um, when they're you know duty bound to consider our path to net zero, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't. I wouldn't say it's the end. Uh, hopefully, it's just a minor uh, minor yet another minor delay. There you go. Okay. Well, actually, we will put a link to that petition if we can find it in the comments underneath this post. So we'll try and drive as many people to sign it as we can because I'm sure everyone watching this cares deeply about that problem. And so yourself and Tessa, I think it'd be fair to say are a couple of steps ahead of some of the other founders that I've interviewed on this series so far. So kind of eight years in, reflecting on that journey you've been on so far, what are those kind of key milestones that you would say you're most proud of throughout that time? Well, um, I think one of the things Tessa and I did really well is set the foundations for our partnership at the beginning. We actually took a whole weekend. This is my memory. It could be could have been a day, could have been three days. I don't know. It felt like a weekend. And we took the Founder's Dilemma book and we sat down with it and we went through the whole thing. And we really had like open, honest conversations about what our priorities were, what we valued, where our strengths were, what we'd like doing, we didn't like doing. And, and we documented it all. Um, and that served as the basis for sort of who does what, how we do things, how we communicate with each other, how we make decisions, what our values are to this day. And I think our, our our partnership, our friendship, and our sort of respect for each other is our number one key success factor because it's not easy. We've had more setbacks than I could possibly count, um, and it's a very emotional journey, which I'm sure most of your audience and everyone really rec- you know can, can relate to, whether you're a founder or just a, a, you know a human. Um, and so having that, having um, I often call Tessa my, my work wife, which I'm not sure if she likes or not, but it would, <laughs> our partnership really does feel like a marriage and like we give it as much care and consideration as we do our, our actual marriages. And I think um, that's my number one most important piece of advice is to is to treat that co-founder relationship with um, respect because it can be your secret weapon. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I mean, I would say coming back that that having us a really strong sense of values and then using those to make decisions. So our values are caring, resourceful, um, ambitious and inclusive. And we obviously have a lot of, it's on our website, if anyone's interested, we've got a lot more detail into what each of those actually means in practice. And everything we do from recruitment to performance management, to strategy setting, to making trade-offs um, is, is seen through the lens of, of our values. And having that I guess, framework um, and, and consistency, I think has been really, really helpful so that 
because it can often feel like you're just like like running from one place to another and your mind's all over the place but like it just helps to i guess uh con control or not control but pro provide a sense of um your what you know what your guardrails are as you're sort of going navigating like really choppy and uncertain waters um i think the other thing that we've done well is that we've lent into being a founder-led brand mm -hmm. um that was really out of necessity to be honest in the beginning because we had no money and but we had time and energy and enthusiasm and so we just you know went out there and participated in absolutely everything that we could um like probably a bit ma like manic probably a bit manically <laughs> in the beginning but but that got us on the circuit and if that makes sense i mean all of a sudden we were on the circuit as people who would you know take a phone call at 11 o'clock at night to talk to a journalist in Singapore, even though we didn't have any people in Singapore. And it's like, it's like, we just basically never said no in the beginning. Yeah. Now we're a lot better at it now and you can't do that for eight years, but for the first couple of years, it was just yes to everything. Even when we weren't sure what the return on that time or that it, where it would lead. And it, but it, what it did is it gave us this visibility, which then turned into this like perpetual asset because we already had some visibility then when journalists are looking up, like, who do I talk to about food waste? Like we come up on the search engine search results. And so it just sort of means now, like even we had a PR firm for a while, but we haven't, we also stopped because we we're, you know, trying to conserve runway in this external environment. Um, but we still get loads of inbound. And so I guess that would be a, another bit of advice. If you can, it's obviously difficult with families, but I just took my son everywhere and gave him a book or an iPad. And he was like, you know, at, at meetups meet and VC pitches and things like that. Anyway, hopefully. Yeah, I, and that is something that you have both done really, really well. And I wonder, obviously, given that your platform is B2C primarily, I appreciate there is also a B2B and a B2B2C element to it, but largely B2C, right, getting individuals onto that platform by building your profile and getting your names out there as much as possible i suppose it increases the amount of people that you're able to pull into the platform right would it would that would that work as well in b2b do you think um i don't know but to be honest most of the time that i'm out like i do we do quite a lot of speaking and mm -hmm. for me most of that is a b2b play okay. quote unquote because mm -hmm. i'm trying to reach sustainability professionals at large organizations um, or operational professionals um, who, you know, any business anywhere that has food. So, for example, we don't just rescue food from supermarkets. We rescue food from hundreds of offices that um, have corporate catering, banks, like law firms, consultancies, um, production studios, um, cor uh, uh, event spaces. So, it, and, and, you know, we have a small sales team, um, but the most effective thing I could do is if I want to reach... Uh, sustainability sustainability professionals in the hospitality space, then I need to get on a panel mm. at an event yeah. where they're in attendance, and it's it's a sales it's a sales strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah. With regard to the C to C strategy, uh, what we realized quite early on, and it was definitely not part of our original plan, is that food food waste and hunger and the environment and um, social isolation, all the things that we're tackling with Olio people feel very emotional and passionate about, and they, they want to do something about it. And so we have relied on the generosity of volunteers from day one. We've had well over 100,000 people um, volunteer, either to rescue and redistribute food or to um, spread the word about Oleo in their local community. And we have um, an entire sort of program whereby passionate members of our community can um, follow the steps to go out and basically spread the word, sign up their neighbors, put up flyers, talk to their local schools, libraries, press, you know, sort of basically building their, their own sharing community because we can't go out and do that everywhere ourselves. And that would be completely cost prohibitive. And so that is how we've managed the C2C side. And part of that is, um, is building a relationship with those, um, with those um, individuals as Tessa and Sasha, who are also full-time, you know, working full-time, juggling parenting. Um, so just, just to move quickly on then to the, to the funding piece, because I think yes. that's something that's really crucial here. And this is where the big gap's happening, right? That the women, female family teams aren't getting the money. Yourself and Tessa 
have gotten <laughs> a good chunk of that money and have been through, I believe, five funding rounds. We have, yes. Now. So what, just in a nutshell, I suppose, uh, what was your experience of going through that fundraising process at each of those rounds? How much did it change and how much, why do you think you got the money where perhaps others haven't? Um, very good questions. And uh, uh, I'd love to say that it's all down to, to skill and a magic formula, but there's certainly some luck involved with fundraising. But I can tell you what I think we did well that might be helpful. Um, first, just to want to point out that between Tess and I, we have over 30 years of experience in, you know, large corporates. So I think we're considered a pretty safe, and we're both now in our late 40s. Um, so um, we are considered a safe, a safe pair of hands, I think. There was a lot of, okay, I don't know how you're going to do this or fix this problem, but we trust you as individuals to navigate through it based on your sort of career um, achievements to date. So that was quite helpful. Um, the other thing I think we learned quite early on is to, not some investors we talked to could care less, absolutely less about the environment. We needed to pursue this purely from a scale and commercial um, um, angle. And then other investors, impact investors we talked to, we needed to really lean into all of the impact that we were going to have and why it would help them to achieve. So I guess know your audience and tailor your message and make sure you don't have a one size fit all approach to, to how you're selling it. Um, I think our, We've gotten really good at um, sharing our personal stories. Tessa grew up on a farm. I come from a background where there was very little money. My parents were hippies. Like we both have these really compelling personal narratives that we're able to like anchor investors around and get them emotionally bought into who we are and what why we will not stop and we will be relentless and why we care so much about the problem we're solving. Um, also, we raised in a period of just crazy capital like there was so much money available i mean remember the you know get here and gorillas and zap and all of that joker i mean you know billions went into that in a very short period of time and like the industry barely exists anymore and and we were raising in that environment where there was a sort of a growth at all costs mindset v, um vcs were because of either you know, zero rate zero uh, percent interest rates, whatever. I'm sure everyone understands. There was a lot of money. It was easier to raise versus now. I don't think we'd be able to raise a penny. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but we would not be able to take our Series B deck and go out and raise a Series C. Like the investors are looking for very, very, very different um, things from a business to make them investable right now than they were before. Um, I'm getting a bit sidetracked. What was the... Um, What's the other question? So timing was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I would say is we've got a motto called ABF, which stands for always be fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is you don't fundraise just when you need, you know, you've got six months runway left in the bank. Like Tessa, who leads on fundraising, is probably 30 to 50 percent of her job all year round, regardless of even if we just raised last month is building relationships and taking and taking investors on our on, on the journey with us so that we um yeah so i guess i think a lot of people underestimate how much effort goes into relationship building and that it's not something you do on an ad hoc basis it's just a core part of your job as a ceo and i think you're right i think people fundraise as a means to an end and it's something that's an uncomfortable experience especially and often for women who feel it's it's something that they don't really have fair access to or know a lot about and they're apprehensive about so they almost put off having to do it until they need to do it go through it come out the other end i've got the money oh, i haven't got to do that again for a while i mean honestly our success rate with female investors was probably 10x oh, what yeah. it was with male investors as well like we really struggled and we had some interview you know uh pitches where like a, a male investor be like well i'd have to talk to my wife and my cleaner about food surplus i literally have no idea if we have any um oh it, it just it's we still live in a our, our our audience is predominantly female. Our, our product is solving predominantly female, a, a, a predominantly female problem because yeah. women are still predominantly in charge of buying stuff for the house, whether it's a school uniform or it's, you know, the, the filling the fridge. Um, that's an exaggeration, but it is actually true um, in that it's, um, that is the case. So we had a much higher, success speaking to women and, and seeking out women. Um, but the problem is that 
uh, there's not enough female investors who have decision making or check writing um, uh, account ownership or whatever it is that you you want to call it. And so, um, you know, the, if we really want to see more investment into female founded companies, we need to see better representation around the investment committee board That's table. So true. I think I read um, yesterday only 14% of angels are female. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now that said, I am part of an angel, a female angel founding like WhatsApp group or not angel founding, like women investing in women. Mm-hmm. And there is so much passion and so much um, willingness, I think, to go above and beyond to make sure that women get equal access to capital and opportunity. And so don't get too discouraged by the numbers. The numbers are what the numbers are. Like we can't change those overnight. Um, and actually sometimes you can think about being a female founder as a, as also as a secret weapon because people are aware of the problem and they don't, people don't like it that it's a problem. And you, you might be able to use it to your advantage to, get some cut through with regard to an email getting opened or getting a first call or whatever. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that I'm sure most people are aware of this, but just be, um, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done around promotion versus prevention questions and what types of questions women get asked and how to respond to them in a way to mitigate, um, just basically have a more effective outcome. I'm forgetting the name of the woman who did the research at Harvard into this, but it's quite well known and there's a TED talk on it. And it's, I highly recommend that everyone looks into, into that. Maybe you can put a link into the. Yeah, I uh, will definitely. Right. I'll go and search that up for you. I think it's Dana. Oh, I'm blanking. Okay. Perfect. Um, so just, I appreciate you have to go to the person at the door. So I won't keep you for too much longer, but we always round out these episodes by giving three top tips, three resources that you would recommend. So the first one being a people or community based resource that you've used throughout your career, doesn't have to be on your entrepreneurial journey, but throughout your career that has helped you. So a network or a community. Um, I belong to a um, to a community of founders. It's about 250 founders. And uh, twice a year we get together and we go on a retreat. Um, and we, um, it's total like all in. Um, anyway, long story short, it has been absolutely essential. And there's loads and loads and loads. I actually belong to like eight networks of, of founders. There's loads of different ones. Um, and this is the one that I've just connected with the best. And I've gotten really involved in it. And I was on the advisory board for a while. And like, it's just been absolutely essential for me. Like your, your husband, your friends, your, you know, there's not that many people who want to talk to you endlessly about your business all day long. So find a tribe of people who are, who are that interested. Amazing. And what's that called? It's called Founders. Founders. It's actually an invite. Like you, you won't be able to find it if you look it up. But there are lots of them around. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. So finding something like that where you can just geek out yeah. all day on your business with other people that care. Yeah. Perfect. And the second resource being a media based resource. So a book or a podcast or a TED talk that has inspired yeah. you. I mean, I think that the Lean Startup. And the mom test are sort of both essential readings for anyone who's sort of at the beginning of their journey. I'm a podcast addict. I listen to loads of podcasts. What I listen to has changed over the time. Um, In the beginning, this weekend started with Jason Calacanis. I listened to every episode. Now I'm a bit further along. I listen to um, All In, which is also a Jason Calacanis um, podcast, every episode. Um, there's how I built this. Um, I listen to a lot of Kara Swisher um, and Sam Altman and Y Combinator. It's probably a bit out of date now, but they did a, a startup school back in 2014 where they basically had, I think, 24 episodes with 24 different sort of Silicon Valley leaders, each on a different area. And um, we listened to that multiple times and found it just sort of really essential, basic um, stuff, basic, basic helpful helpfulness, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Excellent. So we'll get links to all of those and share them for everybody. Thank you so much for that. And then the last question being who, and, and also I should preface this question by saying you and Tessa have been the most popular answers to this question in the series so far. So who is your business role model, either within the climate space or more broadly than the world of business that you look up to that if other people haven't heard of, they should go and check out? 
Oh, I'm not going to be able to answer this question spontaneously. I'm so sorry. I'll say I'm horrible at these types of questions. And you can give me several if there are lots of names that pop to mind in different names. No, it's the opposite. I'm drawing a blank. I always draw a blank when someone says, like, if you could have dinner with three people, oh, yeah. always. You know, who would they be? I'm horrible at this. I'll just, yeah. I'm going to have to take a pass and then I'll follow up. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine don't worry don't worry well Tessa that Sasha sorry that has been absolutely amazing it's been so great to speak to you in a short period of time you were given us such a dense amount of advice and information that I'm Good. sure will be valuable to so many other female founders on this journey just a few steps behind you wanting wanting to achieve the things that you and Tessa have achieved so thank you so much for your time for being so generous with your knowledge and experience and enjoy your bike ride <laughs> my pleasure um have a lovely day enjoy the sunshine Thank you. And thank you to everybody that's been watching today. I really appreciate it. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, we've got nine other episodes. Um, so please feel free to go and check those out. But have a great day. Goodbye.